doing research on pedestrians and crowds and also crowd disasters for a couple of years. So classically, uh, pedestrians have been studied like this, you know, you take a view from the top, you determine the density, and then you come up with a classification of different levels of service, as uh, Professor Froon has suggested that, and it's being used until today, actually. So one notable conclusion of this kind of analysis is you shouldn't plan any pedestrian facility for the maximum possible flow because that's a flow level that's perceived to be very uncomfortable. So people wouldn't like this optimal <coughs> flow condition. So from that point of view, you know, if you engineer for people, then it's important that you take into account that they feel comfortable about these solutions. And so we certainly shouldn't go towards level uh, DEF. Basically, already densities of one person per square meter, um, maximum two is that what you should be considering. Now, the situation of course is a little bit different for walkways, for stairs and queues, and there have been manuals outlining what would be uh, the different levels of service for different kinds of density conditions. But there are two kinds of signs, somebody said. You know. what, one is butterfly sign, so you collect and you classify. And the other science is physics, and physics is about understanding, about coming up with explanatory models, right? And of course, physics, and butterflies are nice, but physics is even more exciting. And so it's very important that we recognize that our thinking determines what we see, yeah? So we've been educated to see certain things, and we may not see other things. Yeah, so like this cat, which has been raised in a cage with vertical bars, if you put it into a cage with horizontal bars, it won't be able to see them. Yeah? Because it hasn't been raised with these conditions. In fact, I mean, this is just an example that I made up, but there has been an experiment that has been done with certain kinds of birds, and this is exactly what you find. So it's, it's not just invented by myself, right? And so what happened uh, is that when I started to do pedestrian research, that is uh, the center of the city of Göttingen, where I studied physics, and uh, some of the most famous physicists have uh, been working in Göttingen, uh, like Max Planck, for example. And so, <laughs> by the way, this is called the Nabel uh, der Welt. So <laughs> they say it's kind of the center of the world, and I'm sure that in every city there is such a place. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, what I want to say is you need to leave your lab. Yeah, in order to do real world observations. So I was sitting there, I was observing people, yes. And I discovered things that people, uh, engineers who've been working on pedestrian flows and pedestrian designs for decades, haven't seen. They just didn't recognize it because it was so normal that they didn't notice it. So wh what is it that you notice over here? People keep to one side. Sorry. Absolutely true. Yeah. Keep right. They're keeping on the right hand side over here. And so I got and interested. Do you observe Singaporeans? Uh, I'll do this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> we are a little bit confused. Sometimes we're on the right side, sometimes on the right. Side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I call this phenomenon lane formation, and this is one of the things that I wanted to understand better. So what I want to say is density is surely important, but dynamics is much more exciting. And uh, in fact, I, I 
and have then started to take videos in different cities. So this is in a shopping mall in Hungary and you can very clearly see this lane formation and the separation phenomenon of the different directions of motion. And the remarkable thing is that it doesn't take a law nor a sign telling people what to do, nor a policeman, it just happens. And you would talk to people, uh, how they have behaved, what, whether they noticed anything, they would say, no, what should have happened, you know? So that basically, that happens automatically, subconsciously even, yeah? So, and that's why we call it a self-organization phenomenon. This is an automatic outcome of the interactions between people. And we'll have to see whether we can understand that as a result of simple interaction laws. Here's a picture, by the way, from Great Britain. And this is just to illustrate that there is not automatically a correlation between the side on which cars drive and the side on which people walk, because in London, of course, cars drive on the left. Uh, while here in Oxford Street, people are walking on the right. Um, now, I was also taking pictures, and uh, these pictures basically inspired me that we might treat pedestrian flows like fluids. So in my diploma thesis, I was starting to develop a fluid dynamic theory for pedestrian flows. Mm -hmm. And then it turned out, uh, at that time, you, know, you still had to go to the library. And uh, I did that, and uh, we use a typewriter in order to get all this <laughs> literature. Yeah, that, that was really funny. And it turned out it was an Australian called Henderson who had applied fluid dynamic equations to pedestrians, but he assumed, just assumed that people would behave like fluids. And that means he, he transferred the equations of fluid dynamics without questioning whether the conditions were fulfilled to use them. While I was asking this question, are people like fluids? And of course, they are not really like fluids because there are a number of differences. Like in fluids, when two particles collide, there is a conservation of momentum and of the collisional energy. If two pedestrians interact with each other, no, one person may slow down and the other person may not even respond. So we don't have the same kind of interaction law. We don't have a conservation of momentum and energy. And as a result of this, you cannot just use the fluid dynamic equation from physics, but you have to derive specific fluid dynamic equations for pedestrians that take into account these special kinds of interaction and also take into account that they have a desired direction of motion and the desired speed. So I was modifying the equations to adjust them to pedestrian flows. Right? Um, here is a nice video that shows you these fluid properties. So, People are waiting in front of a cinema and then the show ends and some people get out. You can see it's something like a river bed is formed and then you see two shock waves actually. Two sudden forward motions of uh, these waiting people. <clears throat> and this is interesting that it's not a continuous flow, but there are these two shock waves, and it shows you that there, there might be some danger in a crowd because of this discontinuous motion, right? I was also doing field observations in other places, like <laughs> discotheques, you know. I used to be young too. <laughs> and uh, what I observed was that there were standing people and there were dancing people, and the 
the density of the dancing people was usually much lower than the density of the standing people. And I was reminded basically of the laws of gases, yeah, which basically stated that um, temperature and density are inversely related. And so that was kind of another sign for me that we could apply the laws of physics to understand some of this. So equations for gases, equations for fluids, and also equations actually for granular media. When the densities are really high, so high that basically one body is next to the other body and there are forces transferred between one body and the next one. And those are conditions that might lead to crowd disasters. <clears throat> okay, so let's look into this phenomenon of self organization more. I've really been interested in the, the course. It's pretty fascinating that somehow patterns are formed that are basically not defined by the intentions or the behavior of a single person. So it's really the outcome of the interaction of many people. And one of the things that I was also interested in is understanding why there was a preference for one particular site in a certain country, right? Like um, in many European countries, it's the right hand side, but there's some countries where <coughs> it's the left hand side. So there is a behavioral convention. I was wondering why this is the case. And in fact, it turns out that you can use game theory, evolutionary game theory, to understand this. And what happens here is that there is a, a coordination game. So people only can successfully pass each other if they both go to the right hand side or both go to the left hand side well if one goes right the other left then they will still be in front of each other and they won't succeed to <laughs> evade each other and so that's a coordination game and in the coordination game the 50 50 mixture like 50 percent going right 50 percent going left is unstable that means a small variation around this 50-50 situation will drive your system into a stable equilibrium and that could be the right hand side or the left hand side but one of them will result and then it's basically something that people learn and that establishes itself as a behavioral convention right? we also did experiments and um, there are some interesting findings too. Uh, for example, if you have counterflows, then uh, flows are sometimes more efficient than if you have unidirectional flows because people see each other and respond to each other while people don't see so far, at least. Uh, I, I have an invention that I'd like to make with you. So if somebody wants to do this with me, I think uh, we should basically build uh, a third eye, you know, that sees what happens behind us. And we can do that with a camera and with a, a glass, uh, electronic glasses that would uh, basically give us a surround pic picture of our environment, you know? And in that situation, people would uh, respond to each other probably in a better way, and uh, we could uh, move better in than at high densities. Now, one other interesting observation is that at bottlenecks, you find oscillatory flows. Okay. So for some time, people are passing from this side. And then after some time, people are passing from the other side. And we were interpreting this as a result of pressure that builds up on the side where people have to wait. Where there are more and more people arriving and they would become more impatient and you know, push stronger and stronger towards this bottleneck. And in this way, they would stop the other flow and eventually uh, take over it. 
there is a movie. You have to focus on, on the right hand side and then you can see that sometimes it's more in this direction, sometimes in the other direction. But I recommend you to really make your own observations and you go out with your smartphone and record these kinds of situations. Yeah, and then you discover something new. Uh, the pressure principle is clearly visible in this kind of situation over here. So first everyone gets out of the vacuum. And once that has happened, people go in. <laughs> we also looked at uh, crossing flows, and in crossing flows you find uh, interesting phenomena too. So, basically, uh, this is the question, can you cross another pedestrian flow without stopping. Can you demonstrate it? <laughs> uh, well, I've seen Japanese uh, those uh, precision squad do cross like this. So they can cross each other without stopping. Right. <laughs> if, if, no, if I had to invent such a thing, I probably wouldn't have found this solution. But in fact, what happens is this. So, this is similar to lane formation. We call this tribe formation. So, it's again a pattern formation phenomenon. And what happens is that you can, the, the stripes move forward and you can move sideways within the stripes. And in this way, it's like magic, you can really walk through this stream. <laughs> of people without stopping. It's incredible. You know? So this just happens automatically. You know? it, if we would have to sit down, you know, we would maybe need hours to come up with a solution, maybe we didn't find it even. You know? But if we just walk, it happens by itself, you know, isn't that fascinating? Yeah, here is a movie. We don't have enough people in Germany to really make it in a different <laughs> way. <laughs> but, you, know, you, you can do these experiments much better over here. And then you send me, <laughs> you send me your videos, okay? Squeeze through this one. So and most of the time people really don't stop, and that's kind of surprising. Why? <laughs> Why we increase like, the number of people? You make it that's a... I think it's linear in a sense, because the speed is moving. Yeah, I, I think so too. You know, if, if you have a 10 meter wide flow of, of people, and then you use a drone, yeah, to make the video, you send it to me, okay? Deal, <laughs> <laughs> okay? I mean, maybe that's even worse than nature paper. Or <laughs> hey, that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's try this together, okay? Uh, 30 co-authors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, 10,000 10, with all these people <laughs> participating in, in the experiment. Anyway, so there are different kinds of pedestrian models, yeah? Um, microscopic models that basically model each single pedestrian's behavior. Macroscopic models that are looking at the density and their change in space and time, like the fluid dynamic models. And there is something in between that we call mesoscopic. And these are the gas kinetic models that also take into account the speed distribution. And over time, you know, people have developed dozens, if not hundreds, of uh, pedestrian 
models and uh, they're of these different types and they're also queuing models which are even uh, more coarse grained than fluid dynamic models they basically just look at rooms and how many people flow in and out of the rooms and how many are in, in these rooms at a certain point in time so it's not a spatial resolution anymore and yeah we could of course discuss all these uh, different models so for some time pedestrian facilities have been planned with design guidelines and have been these kinds of spreadsheets where you basically put in numbers and then it would tell you in the end how many meters of walkway you need uh, to be able to uh, serve all these pedestrians that you expect to be there and you would have that also for intersection areas and so on and so forth now and these formulas look more or less scary and uh, if you wanted to do an analysis of the evacuation of a cinema that was really a difficult challenge of course you had to calculate the, the times it takes until the cinema would be emptied and you can already guess this is a sophisticated task yeah today all these analyses are done with agent-based computer simulations and so there's software tools that do it for you basically kind of the tricky thing is to choose the parameters right because by slightly changing the parameters you know you could reduce the evacuation times apparently you know and then you can basically sell a design that allows you to have more people inside but if there is a fire then a lot of people would die yeah and and so it's your responsibility to make sure that you don't fiddle the parameters in a way that would uh, endanger people's lives in case of a fire or, or some other evacuation situation right and this is kind of the the new risk yeah to, to be tempted uh, by by money to, to come up with uh, designs that wouldn't be secure but the lives of people are of course more important and now the challenges of pedestrian modeling are that pedestrian crowds are compressible so it's more complicated than fluids we have different directions of motion that it might even cross so you need to have a multi-fluid approach um, and you also have to consider that pedestrians have a certain size so a certain excluded volume and frictional effects and so on so this is in the end pretty sophisticated and it turns out that the best way to simulate pedestrians is not with fluid dynamic models but actually with ancient based models so each pedestrian is represented by one computer agent and then the question still is why can we do such a simulation because at least uh, some people believe that humans have a free will and uh, their behavior is unpredictable to a certain extent yeah? and so why can we come up with computer models for their behavior well the issue is um, the higher the density the more restrictions do we have yeah? so it's the same thing on a freeway if there are cars in front of you and besides you and behind you you cannot do much basically <laughs> you have to go with the flow <laughs> so uh, the higher the density the more predictable the situations become and uh, somehow the uncertainty on the individual level like will you turn right or go straight or will somebody else go right and turn straight that doesn't matter it averages out in a sense and so we can treat pedestrian flows in a statistical way and uh, this leads us uh, to, to the gas connecting of fluid dynamic uh, understanding in the end and that, that derives from the microscopic interaction so the microscopic interactions on the other hand are surprisingly predictable because 
We don't want to lose time. We don't want to bump into other people. And so over time, we learn to behave more and more optimal. And the optimal behavior um, is somehow mathematically defined. So uh, we basically have to find the mathematical laws that optimize uh, the flow of people. And that would be the equations describing their behavior. And what I've done is I, I have formulated a social force model, which was inspired basically from force models in physics. And then let's see what happens. So there are two equations, an equation of motion and an acceleration equation. The equation of motion just says that uh, the speed of pedestrian alpha determines the change of location x with time. Okay, we wouldn't expect anything else than that. But the question is how to specify the change of speed with time, that means the acceleration. And this is where I made this assumption that we can basically <coughs> add up different force terms, where each force term describes a certain effect. Like the driving force would describe that people want to work with a certain desired speed in the desired direction of motion. And their actual speed might be different from this, but uh, there would be an adaptation process that would take some time. Then there would be interactions between pedestrian alpha and other pedestrians beta. And uh, these interactions would most of the time be of a repulsive nature to keep some distance. Same thing with boundaries, so we need to keep some distance from streets and walls and so on. And so basically a certain focal pedestrian is influenced by these different forces and we just add them up to determine a certain um, change of speed. And now you can of course argue whether the superposition law, this ad adding of forces makes sense. And it's certainly not exact, yeah, in contrast to physics. But there's some justification for it, uh, even for the behavior of people. And there have been experiments that uh, people did with, with mice and with rats. So they, they put Newton meters at the necks of these animals to measure how strongly were they pulling into a certain direction. Yeah? And then they had different kind of so-called stimuli. One stimulus was a, a piece of cheese or something that they liked to eat, so that it was attracting them. And the closer they got, the, the stronger were they pulling. On the other hand, they also had uh, repulsive effects, such as an uh, electrically charged body. And whenever you touch this, it hurts. So they were running away from this. And once they had a certain distance, they were not pulling so much away anymore. Now the question is, what if you combine these two stimuli? Now, if you add up these different curves, then you get this. And it basically says there is a repulsion area, there's an attraction area, and there is a zero force in between. So what does that mean? What do you expect will happen? Well, if you put the mouse in a large distance, then it, it would sink out. Oh, there is this wonderful piece of cheese and it would work there and at this place it, it would hesitate and say oh there was this electrically charged body maybe I, I should stay away from this and wouldn't know what to do right would you put it here it would run away and i would say ah oh, but there was this nice piece of cheese <laughs> but again it wouldn't know what to do so if you can make this experiment it, it turns out that apparently uh, the animals would behave like this. So there, there would really be this hesitation point over there. Yeah. So from that point of view, if we behave similarly, um, 
and there's some evidence for this too, you know. Um, then certainly such a, a sum of forces makes sense. Uh, we would have to specify the force terms in more detail. And so the interactions can be split up into uh, psychological repulsion, kind of a territorial effect or, you know, the wish to keep some distance. Physical interactions, if you come too close and oops, bump into each other. And attractions between people, like that could be friends or family members or tourist groups or whatsoever. And here's also a fluctuation force that takes into account that there's some unpredictability to it. And there's also some unpredictable behavior in this PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> Okay, and then we basically played around with a number of specifications of the repulsive forces. Like uh, we assumed they could be represented as gradients of a potential. And the potential would either be a circular potential or an elliptical specification. And in this second elliptical uh, specification, we took into account that people respond also to relative velocity that the, you're already trying to anticipate the next step of other people and wouldn't walk uh, to a place where they wanted to put their foot. So basically, all that can can be taken into account, and then you have to determine the parameters in this model. And so what you do is you apply a calibration procedure where, first of all, you have to take some videos, then you have to determine their trajectories, and then you're trying to predict the trajectory of a single person given the motion of the other persons. And of course, there is always a deviation between your computer simulated prediction of that trajectory and the real trajectory. And you want to minimize this deviation by the choice of the parameters. And eventually you find parameter values that minimize that deviation between the simulated position and the actual position. Of course, if you do this minimization for all the pedestrians in, in your recording, uh, you find these optimal parameter values. And then it turns out that the elliptical model two is the best. And that you also have to take into account, besides this exponential decay of the repulsion force with distance, you have to take into account this asymmetry in behavior. So basically, people respond to what happens in front of them and a little bit to what happens on their side, but very little to what happens behind them until we have invented this uh, third eye thing. Yeah? And, and uh, the next thing that we did was uh, we really did detailed experiment. Yeah. So by that time, I, I should say now, when we started to do the pedestrian simulations, I of course had the idea that we could determine the forces from trajectory. Well, in physics, for example, you shoot particles on other particles and then it changes the direction of these particles and from the distribution of the directions you det can determine the interaction forces yeah so there's a mathematics like uh, inverse scattering theory that allows you to determine these interaction forces and i always thought 
we will never be able to do such a thing for pedestrians. And then camera technology became better and better and suddenly we could measure trajectories quite accurately, you know. And we did these experiments, they took three cameras, they put these sexy table tennis balls on the shoulders of these experimental uh, participants and looked what their behavior was. And so the first situation was acceleration of people. You can see, you know, we can track even the up and down of the shoulders while you move along. So you basically find an ex exponential law for the adaptation uh, to their desired speed, which is about 1.3 meters per second. And then next we were looking at interactions. So first of all, interactions of the person with a standing person. And uh, we did that with many people, 50% women, 50% men. And we did that also with two moving people, and then with three, and so on. So you know, that's a lot of experimental effort. And all the trajectories were recorded, and uh, you could do some statistics. Yeah? And depending on the distance between the two people, they were behaving in different ways. And in particular, you were finding this asymmetry in the side choice. Uh, when the other pedestrian was standing, this asymmetry was small. When both were moving, there was a very large asymmetry. So all these experimental data had to be reproduced by our model. And this is basically the force field that we experimentally determined. Uh, we could describe that. This is now a data-driven approach. Yeah? Before, we, we did it in a different way. We assumed a certain model. Each model had a number of parameters, and these parameters were optimally adjusted. Now, this time, we have so many data that we can do a data-driven modeling approach. So we basically extract from the data what kind of forces we have. And so uh, we were splitting up into a, a confrontational situation and you can see there is in fact an exponential decay as we had assumed before so we were quite lucky with our assumption and then there is a directional change component which needs to be added and if you do that you can reproduce the force fields and the flows and the trajectories pretty well and also the preference for one site and uh, in particular that this preference is much more pronounced uh, if two people are uh, both smooth moving so there's an amplification or a reinforcement effect now all these analyses to determine the interaction forces were done on a microscopic level, that means person-to-person -person interactions. Besides reproducing these microscopic data, we were now making another test. We were trying to predict the flow of many people and their interactions. So we were making a recording in a pedestrian zone like this really not very crowded as compared to, to here and um, it predicts a, a certain lane formation phenomenon as we've seen it before so we have a asymmetric distribution of people and the nice thing is that also this macroscopic distribution of people has been reproduced uh, pretty well by the microscopic model even though our model was not adjusted to that kind of uh, observation, right? We just took the parameters that we had uh, found in our microscopic analysis. Okay, um, so now we have models and we can just simulate these models. And if we do this, we actually find the lane formation phenomenon. 
And in fact, I should say, even if we don't assume in our model a certain preference for a site, but if they would behave completely symmetrical with respect to the right and left hand side, we would still find lane formation. And that is interesting, of course, you know, if, if people have a preference for one side, okay, lane formation is not a surprise, but if they don't have a preference, then this is interesting. And the point here is that basically this lane formation minimizes the frictional effects between the two opposite directions of motion, right? So it's kind of uh, an efficient state that results. The system by itself is trying to reduce the friction, yeah? And that, that is what produces the lane formation. Um, one can also do a simulation of a bottleneck situation and what you find here is this back and forth that I already mentioned before. And you can see that on, on one side people are accumulating and that causes an increasing pressure. And this pressure then basically causes the turning of the flow direction. So it looks like there would be a pedestrian light, traffic light, yeah, or a policeman um, regulating the flow. But it's not needed here. Yeah, there might be a situation where it's needed, but in this situation, it happens by itself. So, so what what we did is is this independent of the density on the two sides? Or what happens when you increase the density? Well, it becomes a bit more difficult, and it could also be a is very high density. It could cause a blockage. Actually. It could have a grid lock. Yeah, a grid lock. That could happen. Yeah. But we have done a number of things here. Uh, just as a side remark, we have compared that uh, with the motion of stock markets, where you also have a pushing into two directions. And now you've got bears and bulls, they're pushing into opposite directions. Right? And there is a paper on, on this. The other thing we have done is we have used this as a construction principle for a self organized traffic light control. Hmm. Yeah, so you can basically see how how these principles can be then transferred back to other systems. Yeah. If you transfer the traffic light, you're talking about for cars? For cars. And actually I'm talking about this in uh, the Create campus on Thursday. Right, uh, Thursday. Thursday. Oh, in, in two days uh, from now. If you still want to join, yeah. So that I believe it will be an interesting topic. And uh, we have also done simulations of these two flows crossing each other, and in fact, you find this giant formation phenomenon. So it comes out automatically. So that's important. Now we haven't created a model just to produce this effect. You know, it comes out automatically as emergent phenomenon, as we say. Yeah. And so this is an explanatory model. We can understand it based on the force. And then finally, one remark on uh, recent modeling approaches. Uh, one day, a um, biologist uh, joined my team and he wanted to come up with a cognitive model. Um, basically, one of the reasons for this was that if there's a group of people, we're responding to the group as an obstacle, um, we are not responding to repulsive, repulsive forces by each single pedestrian, right? And he said, okay, couldn't we come up with a model for this? And in fact, <clears throat> we, we then developed a, a model that was surprisingly simple, although we saw, okay, if we come up with a cognitive model, it should be much more complicated. But in fact, there are two rules mainly which is walking to the least obstructed direction. I mean, everyone is hunting for gaps in the flow. And then second, adjust the speed to keep the time headway constant. And this basically contains even less parameters and produces all the observed phenomena. So this is a nice development. Now, the question is, is this just theoretically interesting or can you use it for something 
And in fact, it turns out that you can simulate realistic scenarios. Uh, for this, you have to test your computer simulation in certain kind of settings. Uh, for example, how does it behave at corners? And the other thing that you have to do is simulate buildings with many rooms, like hotels or cruising ships or whatever. And you have to be able to simulate situations with multiple levels. So staircases. Um, One guy doesn't get up. And then you have to look at the root choice behavior. And so in the first scenario, everyone just wants to take the shortest route. And, <laughs> and then it turns out that this is causing a, a crowded situation. People have to wait and nobody is using this route for a long time. And, and so we had to take into account root choice as well based on walking times and in this simulation we'll see that eventually some people take the other route actually. how it happens right when somebody goes many things follow yeah so stop it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like in reality. <laughs> okay, and you can also do large scale simulations like this uh, with uh, thousands, uh, tens of thousands, or even more than a million pedestrians. Is this a uh, evacuation of something? No, this is just a simulation of uh, tourist, oh, tourists tourist in, in, in Dresden oh, as yeah, assumed. Dresden. <laughs> yeah. How many tourists are, are those? <laughs> <laughs> well, a few thousand actually. A few thousand. Yeah. Now, if you want to simulate a lot of pedestrians, then you need to have a computer program that scales more or less linearly uh, with the number of pedestrians. And we're talking about 2 million pedestrians here. Uh, this is, has been done, I believe, with a supercomputer and I mean, parallel processing. But the main point is that the number of interaction or potential interactions between pedestrians are scaling with n squared, where n is the number of pedestrians. Right, but most of these pedestrian interactions would be with pedestrians that are far away, so you don't really respond to them. So you can come up with a simplified simulation where you just focus on those pedestrians that are within a certain radius, and then your computer program uh, scales linearly. Yeah, this is very important because otherwise you could never simulate a million. And recently, uh, there have been also computer simulations that combine a simulation of public transportation, pedestrians, buses, uh, vehicles, and so on. So you can basically combine all modes of transport. And uh, as you can see, this is a, a computer program offered by PTV. PTV and uh, this um, pedestrian software VizWalk is actually using a simulation core that we have developed. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, this phenomenon of human trail formation. That means if there is a green ground and many people walk, then it uh, creates trails. And these trails are attractive to other people because it's more comfortable to walk these trails. And um, for this, basically, you can develop certain equations, and that has been published in Nature some years ago. 
uh, one interesting thing here is that trails are not just the shortest connection between two points. Yeah? Otherwise it would be boring and certainly never published in nature. The, the important point is that trails are compromises, right? We can see that for some time people share this part of the way and only then it splits up, right? Also, this is not a straight line, and so this, this is kind of the interesting part of it. It's not just a straight connection, and, and this was one of the situations uh, I was analyzing. You know, I was looking out of my office actually and saw this, and I saw like, this is interesting. You know, so if you are a scientist, you, know, you always need to keep your eyes open and will discover interesting thing that nobody has noticed before yeah this is i think everything about a, a great scientist is about seeing things that other people haven't noticed and one point is that uh, you can use these kind of simulations in order to optimize trail systems so assume you don't have enough money or for environmental reasons, you don't want to connect these four points with direct ways, like uh, this and the cross in between. Then what would you do? Well, it turns out that if you run the simulation and you get this pattern over here, so people share this way, if they go here or there or there, Right? So there are compromises, um, and it turns out also that everyone has 22% of detour. So it's a fair solution at the same time. Right? This is pretty interesting. And uh, I think also it's a solution that people would accept. Well, in many cases what happens is you build a way for pedestrians and they would do something else you know and then you, you were angry about pedestrians because they're not respecting your way you know uh, but in fact you've not come up with a good design because they would use a design that was made for them you know i mean we have to understand the psychology and the needs of, of people and of pedestrians in particular to come up with good designs right and if they were not using it, it was not a good design. So one typical thing is we tend to have these cheap crossings, right? And this is what people don't like. So uh, people would prefer to have these wide crossings, yeah? And in fact, there are a, a few architects that have noticed that and have actually implemented that. But you don't see that very often. This is just one hint, you know, how you can improve designs to make them more adjusted to people. Unfortunately, there are situations uh, where the flow of people is not smooth and it can end up in crowd disasters. And one such situation was the left right disaster in Duisburg in Germany in 2010. So that should have been a happy music festival, but what happened was that the density in a certain area became so high and the flow uncontrollable. So in the end, 21 people died and uh, more than 500 people were injured. And first, experts didn't understand what was going on there. You know, why, why could it happen? And Usually what uh, people think is, oh, they have drunk too much alcohol and they were aggressive and they were just not caring, were stepping on other people um, and, and all these kind of things. So basically they're blaming the crowd of misbehavior and uh, that's why it happened, they believe. But this is not true. And even if everyone is peacefully minded, if you don't manage a system in the right way, it can create a disaster where these peacefully minded people will unintentionally kill people. Here are some examples of crowd disaster. That was in a stadium in South Africa, I believe, and 
can see many people storming down and the, the steel barrier is being bent and there's really huge forces in the crowd, right? I read that even brick walls would be destroyed by uh, a crowd of people pushing forward. That's another situation here. It's an emergency exit in a stadium and you can see these policemen, but actually they can't do anything. There is this clogging effect, so nobody gets out. Now, I mean, that's not a useful emergency exit where nobody can leave, right? It's too narrow. Actually. It's too narrow, absolutely. And here is another festival where you will see about 6,000 people falling like in a domino effect. <laughs> And that was um, in the Heisel Stadium in Brussels. And what you see here is that people are falling on top of each other. So they're piled up. And, and it's not possible for people on, on the bottom to get up again. And they have a lot of weight on their body and they can't breathe anymore. <coughs> So the question is, why do crowd disasters happen if nobody wants to harm anybody else? And uh, are crowd disasters a result of people who start panicking for whatever reason? I mean, people often talk about panic, yeah? And so the classical picture is that hey, people panic and that's why they behave in an improper way and that causes the accident. Uh, in fact, some crowd disasters, including myself, think most of the time it's the other way around. They're being crushed or they're, they're, and they're in a life-threatening situation where the pressure is so high and that, that may cause panic, of course. Uh, but so the, the causal relationship is just the other way around. So when we started to look into the phenomenon of crowd disasters um, the first thing we did is we assumed people would be nervous and then what happens is that these lanes that we have observed before they create this orderly passing of a different direction of motion these lanes could break down And it could have these kind of confrontational situations where just people can't pass each other anymore. In fact, that is a situation that actually occurred in Duisburg at this Love Parade disaster that I mentioned before. And we also looked into situations where there is a fire in smoke and sometimes there's so much smoke that you can't even see your head in front of your face you know so it's really <clears throat> difficult to orient yourself and uh, then the question is how would you find an exit <coughs> now it turns out when people are not sure what to do they would tend to orient at other people's behavior because there's this implicit assumption that somebody might know something that you don't know. And so what would happen is that people would use one of these exits rather than both of them, right? And it would be kind of inefficient. So you design a stadium with so and so many exits, assuming that all the exits would be equally used, and then the evacuation capacity is sufficient. But in reality, it turns out that uh, people don't use all the exits in many cases. <coughs> and that means your evacuation capacity is not enough. Yeah. And uh, what happens is that people usually try to go back to that door where they entered. And they don't use the emergency exits. And that's bad. Uh, what you can do is basically when there is a pop concert or some other large event, you should tell the people in the beginning that they should look where the next emergency exit is. So they're aware of this location.
<coughs> and they would basically use these exit pools. So we did some experiments actually with a colleague in Japan, um, Professor Nagatani, and uh, we simulated the situation of heavy smoke uh, where they couldn't see by blindfolding people and putting something up in front of their eyes so they, they didn't know where the exit was and they basically had to, to find their way and um, if single people do this and you find these kind of trajectories so they're walking into a random direction and then along the wall and sometimes that would be the shortest way sometimes it would be the longer way but that's what happens and now, if you have a group of people, if they can see the exit, then of course everyone is just heading towards the exit and that's it. In a situation where you can't see the exit, uh, what happens is uh, what we can see over here. So uh, people would again be heading towards the wall, but in many cases there would be groups of people that would be walking together. and. That causes this kind of uh, hooding phenomenon. Now, given all the knowledge we have collected so far, can we use this knowledge to improve pedestrian facilities? And in fact, this is possible. So one of the things that uh, we have observed before was this logging effect, right? So we have simulated that in a small experiment, but don't do that with many people because otherwise it would be dangerous. Uh, what we can see is you know, there's this clogging uh, we, we had observed in the previous video. So as I said, uh, it's uh, if you do it too many, too many people, it's a dangerous experiment, so don't do this. <laughs> and what we then did is we put an obstacle in front of the door. And the idea is basically to take away pressure from the backs of people. And in fact, uh, this causes a much more fluent outflow of the room, right? So in this case, in, yeah, the obstacle. Yeah, we call this actually sometimes uh, the slower is faster effect, and you can also know this from traffic. Now, a crowd disaster happened already several thousand years ago, and the Romans were an advanced civilization that had building codes already 2,000 years ago. And uh, the Colosseum is known as one, one of the world wonders uh, of, of human civilization and uh, as you can see over here it basically consisted of exits yeah so exits everywhere <laughs> they already had uh, 73,000 visitors six uh, 76 enumerated entrances and people were entering through the exit so um, this is different from how we do it today and the evacuation time was about five minutes uh, better than today. Yeah. Um, now, talking about pedestrian facilities. Now, these are the usual elements of facilities, like uh, corridors, bottlenecks, crossings. They're all wrongly designed. Yeah, and they don't just do something because things have always been done in a certain way. It turns out that, for example, the bottleneck situation can be improved in this way to, uh, by having a, a funnel shape design. The interesting point here is you take away space for pedestrians and it's improving the pedestrian flow. Yeah? In this situation, it's, it's not so surprising because we're used to this idea of a funnel being good for uh, the flow. But once you have understood that taking away space can improve the flow if you do it in a wise way, you would start to think about why not put some obstacles into this corridor or in front of the door as we've just seen it or in the middle of such a intersection. And 
And um, in fact, it turns out that these uh, pillars that are here for a static reason are helping to separate the different flow directions. At the same time, it's a transparent design, so it's a flexible design. It can be used in different ways. So it's basically stabilizing the interface between different flow directions. Now, what can we do at intersections? Now, if there are four different flow directions, uh, then this is usually causing a pretty chaotic flow. And on the other hand, I told you before, if we have two flow directions, we couldn't have the strike formation. Now. Right. So the idea is to break up the intersection into intersection for four flow direction to four intersections for two flow directions. And then you get this thing over here. And if you do that in the right way, then it would cause actually a circular flow. And that would be much more efficient than the chaos flow over here, right? Now just assume now a more general design, any kind of design. So what would you do? Well, you could use actually evolutionary algorithms in order to improve the design. So you start with some original design, then you multiply it several times. You mutate it, that means you have random variations of the design. Then you test it by computer simulation. You need to have an evaluation criteria, for example, efficiency. We measure the average speed of the pedestrian compared to their desired speed. And then you se select the best solutions among those several solutions and multiply them again, mutate them again, and go through the cycle many times. And eventually, we'll get a better solution. So. Let's assume we start with a design which is a bottleneck, yeah? a room and a narrow outflow. So because of the mutations in the beginning, strange things happen you know, that certainly are not good for the flow. But you need to let it happen because otherwise you cannot find novel designs. But what you see after some iterations, you know, it becomes more and more reasonable what happens. And in the end, you get this funnel yeah, and that makes a lot of sense. And you could do that, of course, with much more complicated designs. And um, so we, we started also to have the situation where you just chop mini obstacles and let them aggregate. Uh, and in this way, change the, the shape of the room in, in any particular way, in, in any way. And what we find here for the situation of this bottleneck is that it's good to have either a zigzag shape, yeah, like this, or this funnel shape, which avoids a confrontational flow to the exit. If you have a situation where many people would be uh, potentially pushing towards this exit. Because again, you don't want to have the pressure on, on the backs of the people who are here at this bottleneck. That would be causing, again, uh, the clogging effect, yeah? So by taking away pressure, you improve the outflow of the people. So this is pretty unconventional, but um, in fact, uh, we came up with a similar solution for design elements of Stadia. What happens in Stadia, as we've seen that in the Brussels case, the Heidel Stadium, uh, sometimes <coughs> people fall, that blocks the flow, and then people in the back who don't see what's going on here, they would start pushing because they think somebody is just you know, not paying attention. And so by pushing, people would fall on top of each other and that would cause a, a terrible accident and uh, many people might die. Now here, <coughs> here we have done two modifications. First of all, you see 
the diameter of uh, the corridor becomes larger. Why? For similar reasons as rivers get broader when more and more water flows in, right? So that reduces waiting times, and that it reduces impatience. The other thing that we introduce is zigzag design, because then if people are pushing, not everyone is pushing on these four people down here. So the force is interrupted, you know, this force goes in this direction, that force in that direction, that force in that direction, and that in that direction. So you, you reduce the force acting on the crowd of people. And with this, you, you relieve pressure and, and improve the situation and make it less dangerous. Now, I have been involved in a study, in a, in a project that was about the Muslim pilgrimage in Mecca. And that is a particular interesting case. So um, probably are aware of this situation. It uh, starts with the Tabaf in Mecca, in the Holy Mosque. So people would walk seven times around this holy mosque. And these are actually millions of people. Yeah? So that's a simulation. So basically this is the most important event in the life of a Muslim and I would do it at least once in a lifetime. And for some it's really kind of the most important thing towards the end of their life. They're saving money to do this um, for many years. They land the flight uh, there and it's a many day event. So goes uh, from Kaaba in Mecca to Mina, from there to Arafat and to Musdalifa and Mount Arafat, you have this kind of situation, so people are staying outside overnight. And, and so it goes back and forth for several days. And this is Mina, a few kilometers away from Mecca, where you have this tent camp for 1.5 million people. It turns out though that there are about 3 million people attending this uh, event, so 1.5 million people are somewhere and you don't really know exactly where they are. And um, so this is again the Holy Mosque. And here is the old Jamarat bridge and the Jamarat bridge has three pillars and they represent the devil in fact the temptation by the devil and you should of course resist the temptation by the devil in order to demonstrate you throw small stones so called pebbles at this pillar at the devil you know go away devil yeah and um, you can imagine that if um, Millions of people do this on the same day. This is causing a very crowded situation. And in fact, many crowd disasters have happened in the past. And you can simulate that so for the sake of time. I'm sparing it now, but you can see a highly crowded situation has happened in the past. And uh, this is where many people have died. So one thing that has been done to improve the situation, the circular pillars were replaced by elliptical pillars to have more space, basically to do the, the stoning ritual. And then, however, on, in the preparation phase of the new Jamara bridge, another terrible crowd disaster happened. And that happened over here in the free plaza where, where the ramp to the, goes up to the uh, Jamarat bridge. 
you should know this is 80 meters wide. Yeah, this, this is 40 meters. So you wouldn't imagine this is a bottleneck. But in fact, uh, it turned out to be a bottleneck. And uh, the reason is that people were coming from different directions and it was flowing together with emerging flow. And that created very high densities. Now, there happened to be a video camera, and uh, so we were able to, to analyze the, these video recordings, and we saw some very surprising things. And that pedestrian researchers at that time didn't think would exist. Um, so the first thing what happened was that uh, a laminar flow was suddenly changing into a stop and go flow. And this happened actually when the, the flow dropped with increasing density to lower values. And that basically means that your inflow into the system may still be high, but the outflow might suddenly be much lower than before. It's and like an expressway traffic jam or something. It's, it's creating a, a very crowded situation within a short time period. And, and one of the signs of this crowded situation is the stop and go flow that suddenly appears. <laughs> uh, we can understand that by uh, computer simulation. So if there's just not enough space, then you know two pedestrians might want to use the same space, and you get uh, this kind of intermittent outflows. Yeah. So. However, to our surprise, there was again another sudden transition to another crowd behavior. So we not only had the smooth flow and the stop and go flow, but we also had turbulent flows where people were really pushed into all possible directions. And that happened when the density was so high that, you know, bodies were just next to each other and a little bit of shaking of the bodies which transfer forces from one body to the next one and what happens then is that these forces add up and they would push people around in unpredictable ways and that's what you see over here Now, that is actually pretty similar to a granular flow where you have this formation of force lines and the direction and strength of the forces is all the time changing in, the, in this granular material. Yeah. So, obviously, the situation was so dangerous that it had to be changed. And then the government uh, was investing $1 billion for a new Jamara bridge that would have a much higher capacity. It would have these elliptically shaped devil's pillars and they would have separate ramps from different directions to separate the flows as much as possible. They would also have a unidirectional flow organization that means on the way to the Jamara Bridge, you use different routes as compared to the way back. And that had really a very positive effect on the overall situation because there were less obstructions of the flows. And as a result, it took less time for pilgrims to get from the tent cam to the Jamra bridge and back. And spending less time in the system means that it produces less obstruction, less density, so it became much safer and a much more pleasant experience. So the pilgrims liked that a lot.
but there were a number of other measures taken. Uh, the entire system was organized. So there is, uh, first of all, a flow monitoring their cameras. There's a post-processing of the camera signals in order to find out how many people are on the street, how much of the capacity is used, are we getting towards maximum capacity utilization. In this case, we need to reroute to other routes uh, so uh, these streets would not be overloaded. And there would also be a time schedule for all the pilgrim camps when they would go towards the Jamara Bridge or the Stony Bridge. So not everyone would go at the same time. It's distributed over the whole time. And yeah, that has changed the situation from this one where emergency vehicles really had great difficulties to get towards the people in need. Towards that situation, it was very well organized. And as I said before, the pilgrims like that use it. So I'm closing uh, with a few remarks on the love parade disaster in, in Duisburg. So that uh, should have been a happy music festival, but instead a uh, really terrible situation happened. And like in the Heisel Stadium situation, people were falling on top of each other. And in the beginning, the police didn't understand what was going on there. So the claim was that people had fallen from, from this, yeah, from up there down on the crowd. But that couldn't explain why 500 people were injured. So what I was saying at that time was that uh, most likely there was also this um, crowd turbulence phenomenon that was kind of pushing people to the crowd. Uh, to the ground and, uh, and that caused basically a trampling of the people and in fact then I was studying materials that I could find on the internet and it was very much uh, confirming my assumption but anyway this is the situation that's a festival area over here so everyone had to go through a tunnel to get on the festival area and unfortunately, these tunnels had to be used both ways. That means uh, with uh, counterflows. And uh, that was not well thought of and not, not well managed. And um, it turned out that there was a, a problem getting people on the festival area itself. Uh, and therefore, you know, people were jamming over here and, and then Basically, the police was trying to stop the inflow by police cordons, but they couldn't keep these police cordons. And, and uh, what happened was that people were coming back from the festival and those who wanted to get in got into this kind of confrontational situation where nobody get, could get forward. And the density became extremely high and then things got out of control. But all together you can say, it's like a domino effect. Yeah? One thing led to another thing. One problem caused another problem. And so there were many factors contributing to the outcome. And almost everyone who was somehow involved in the organization of this had some responsibility for the outcome. So everyone contributed a little to it. Everyone might have been able to stop it. So that was kind of an unfortunate uh, domino effect that finally led to a, a circulus a viciosus, a devil's circle where you had an amplification effect that uh, produced a finally uncontrollable situation. And so it was the density that became unbearable for human beings. Yeah, it's also that um, at this density, again, a little bit of shaking of the body causes uh, transfer of uh, a little force on another body, but these forces would add up and would push people around. And uh, so somebody would sooner or later fall down because you stumble 
and then there's a hole in the crowd and those people yeah yeah somehow yeah this is what happens so if, if somebody was holding in front of you the counter for you're pushed from the back but the counter force from the front is not there anymore so yeah you fall on top of the others and, and you know this causes this holding dynamics that is unstoppable and causes the tragedy yeah. so I'm ending with my take-home messages. I don't think I need to read that. So, <laughs> thank you very much uh, for your interest. I I hope this is useful.